I, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, everybody, and it's so good to see such a big uh, audience. Uh, we all know that the evolution of human nutrition is an, an extremely popular topic. And our, our logo actually comes from a street artist named Banksy, who's extremely well known for his graffiti. And it really uh, re reflects the popular concern for our uh, condition in the world today. Uh, the, the, this was on the front cover, cover of The Economist a few years ago. And it actually uh, reflects the uh, situation where we have rising uh, percentages of obesity and uh, overweight in the world. And we, we, we find that this has spawned a whole uh, interest and, in fact, an industry in healthy eating and a healthy diet. And as part of this is an interest in the paleo diet. I mean, it's so easy a caveman can do it. And what the paleo diet people say that will solve basically the problems of obesity and obesity-related uh, illnesses by eating like our caveman ancestors. Now, if you stop and uh, th think about this a bit, uh, a lot of it is what's in the popular consciousness about what a caveman was and what a caveman diet is. And when Ma Margaret and I were uh, planning this meeting about two years ago, there, there was an article in the New York Times about cavemen in the city, and it was subtitled uh, Ancestor Envy. And there, there's a group of people in New York who are trying to live in New York City as cavemen, eating raw food. Uh, they exercise by jumping over park benches and running and throwing stones back and forth. And uh, also, they give blood regularly. Because the, the idea is, is that cavemen were in accidents a lot and bled a lot. So if you're going to be healthy, you need to give blood. Now, we, we, we can sort of laugh at this. But it's a very serious thing about trying to live a healthy life in our world uh, today. Uh, there, 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 there's also a more popular side of this. You can buy caveman cookies that are supposed to be made with ingredients that would have been available to our caveman ancestors. Now, if we stop and think about th this a bit, and an Alex Gregory cartoon from The New Yorker uh, basically says something's just not right here. Because we're living healthy, breathing clean air, eating wonderful food, but we still die at 30 years old. Now, at the, it's not so much this that I think bothers the uh, average paleoanthropologist in relation to the popular conception of what a caveman diet is. Because we actually don't really have one caveman diet. If we, you look at the human record today, the fossil evidence goes back almost seven mi million years. There's a lot of caveman time there. And if you think about the distribution around the world, uh, for the first, what it is it, five million years, four or five million years, our ancestors were in Africa, but they were spread through a variety of habitats from woodland to forest to more open country. And then about two, two million uh, years ago, you had this migration out of Africa through India into Southeast Asia. Uh, you had the more recent uh, mi migration of anatomically modern Homo sapiens, say around 50,000 years ago or so. Our ancestors were off, uh, occupying a number of different ha habitats and also eating a number of different kinds of food. So our earliest ancestors were probably eating diets very similar to modern non-human primates. But as we come up through the record, we have uh, some evidence of aquatic wetland resources, uh, tubers, of course meat, possibly the use of fire, uh, large get game animals, seeds, a variety of different diets. And when you think about it, uh, it's actually a luxury of the modern world to be able to pick and choose your, your diet. Because if nothing else, our caveman ancestors were uh, very, um, uh, they, they were generous. They, they, they were very adept at adapting to the diet they had. And uh, this is probably what one of the hall hallmarks of our species. With this, though, anthropologists have used diet in many different hypotheses and many different ways 
to uh, help to explain and uh, help us understand the course of uh, evolution. You know, if we go back to the 1950s, we had a very different picture of what human evolution was. We th thought our ancestors split off uh, may maybe 15, 16 million years ago from the line leading to our closest uh, re re relatives. And we had very ma many fewer players in the human evolutionary puzzle. And I I in the 1950s, John R Robinson put forward the dietary uh, hypothesis for human evolution. At this time, the only fossils we had came from South Africa. And uh, these were Australopithecus robustus and Australopithecus africanus. At that point, the robustus, the heavy-jawed ones, were thought to be the ancestral species, with africanus branching off and le le leading to homo. And there was the dietary explanation for this. The, the robust Australopithecines were thought to be primarily ve vegetarians. Uh, the Africanus were incipient omnivores, meat eaters. And you had a feedback mechanism where the more meat you ate, the more tools you, you used, the larger your brain became. And ultimately, you became anatomically modern Homo sapiens. By the time we get into the mid-1960s, Lewis and Mary Leakey had made their discoveries at Olduvai Gorge. You had Zygenthropus boisei, the big nutcracker man. Uh, you also had ho Homo habilis. And the, the, the number of players changed a bit. You dropped down with Africanus being slightly older in time. Very importantly here also, there was Ramapithecus, who at 14 million years ago was supposed to be the first hominid. And anybody in my generation believed in Ramapithecus. That's all there was of it, just a small jaw. And you had the reconstruction of this bipedal hominid. The argument, as we remember, was if you had a small canine tooth, you couldn't defend yourself. You had to use tools. If you used tools, you had to stand upright. If you were using tools standing upright, you, your brain was evolving. And it was a straight line up to Homo, with nothing in between. But the important thing was you had this feedback mechanism going that was centered around this dietary uh, idea of more meat, more tool use, larger brain size, bingo humans. In 1970, Jolly came up with the seed-eating hypothesis in the Journal of the Royal Anthropological Association, which at that point was called MAN. Uh, Jolly's seed-eating paper was the most highly cited paper in that journal for over a decade. And the reason was, is with another dietary hypothesis, he uh, gave an initial kick to this feedback system. And by c comparing the dentition of hominids to the dentition of baboons and uh, a large species of extinct baboon called Therapithecus, uh, what he put forward was that the small canines actually came from eating seeds and using your mouth as a grinding uh, organ. And uh, that through this dietary change, you were setting the stage with the small canine. But then you still had the problem of not being able to defend yourself. So throughout the 1970s, you still had this feedback system going. OK, now bringing this up to, to, to the modern day, the picture, of course, has become much more complicated. Ramapithecus has been re relegated to a pre-hominid status. And we have a very complicated roadmap. But diet still plays a very important part in how we try to understand the course of human evolution. Uh, what, what, what we use now is a combination of the diet with the context of e evolution on the far side of the picture there. You have a, uh, or it's the oxygen isotope tra uh, trace showing a shift in the climate from warmer to a drier climate and also an increase in variation. We also have a uh, trace here where we have the increase in cranial capacity. And this period of about uh, 2 million to 1.5 million years ago, where the climate is changing. The brains are expanding. And you have what we seem to, to see as a radical change in the morphology of our early ancestors. You have Australopithecus, as represented by Lucy, dating about 3 million years ago. 
You have the Nariukatomi boy, a virtually complete skeleton of a Homo erectus dating about 1.7, 1.8 million years ago. Now, uh, in the, 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 the 1980s and into the 1990s, these were the epitome of the two main types of humans, the Australopithecines and the Homo, large brain size and Homo, long legs, very elongated body. And very importantly, you have uh, evidence of meat eating and a change of diet uh, at this time period as well. Now, what, what, one of my favorite pieces of evidence for the introduction of uh, more animal-based food into the diet at this period are tapeworms. And in 2001, there was a very interesting paper that came out that showed the closest relative to human tapeworms are tapeworms found in African wild dogs. And what this su su suggests is that there was some su su situation in Africa in about this time period that but put humans in contact with the tapeworms from wild dogs. OK, now what, what, what's interesting about this is if we look at uh, more modern research on the evolution of human diet, we're branching out from rather simplistic um, assumptions to using broader comparative uh, data sets. And th this is one that was very influential to my thinking in the 1990s. You, you have at the far picture body weight and basal me metabolic rate. The little black dot there with the red circle is humans. We have the basal metabolic rate you, you would expect of an animal of our body size. Uh, the close figure here is body weight against brain weight. Humans, of course, have a relatively large brain size for our body weight. The question was, where did we get the energy to fuel this large brain? Because brains are extremely expensive in metabolic terms, uh, you would expect our metabolic rate to be uh, 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 elevated to about the same degree. You see the size elevation here. In 1995, Peter Wheeler and I put forward the expensive tissue hypothesis. And this was a, a very simple thing where we we're looking for that missing basal me metabolic rate. And what we found that was that with the expensive tissues uh, of the body, the only thing that was relatively small was the guts. And uh, they were small enough to almost perfectly balance off the size of the increased brain size. And so what our uh, conclusion was in the mid-1990s is that ancestral humans had to make a change to a high quality diet to allow us to evolve a large brain size. It was no more complicated uh, than that. You can't have small guts if you don't have a uh, easy to di di digest food source. And uh, what was also uh, fun about this is that it had a number of follow on implications. Uh, in terms of the early period of migration about two million years ago, Meat from one animal is pretty similar to meat from uh, another animal, bone marrow, wh wh whatever. Uh, it would solve some of the problems of moving into different environments as you spread throughout the world. But more importantly is what do you do with the kids? Because if you're e eating high-quality animal-based food, it's, a dang it's dangerous to go out and hunt. It takes knowledge. It takes strength. It takes sophistication. You're going to have to have, engage in a lot of food sharing. The set center picture, I always think of her when I'm having a hard day. I, I have a picture of her in my office. And what she epitomizes there is what a woman does. If she's having to feed the infant, she's probably pregnant, she's also nursing. Her own me me metabolic budget is going to go way up. And how is she going to do it? How is she going to get enough food to support herself and her dependents. And you come very easily into an argument that you have to have a whole change in your social structure, cooperation, uh, economic division of labor, and this type of thing. And it, it all comes off of this reasoning about a high quality diet. Now, th this was almost 20 years ago, and things change. Uh, that model was based on a zero sum model, saying that we probably didn't have an in increase 
in the daily energy budget of our early ancestors. And that probably isn't true now. Uh, you ha have uh, from a, a, a number of sources what looks like a positive relationship between ba basal metabolic rate and brain weight as you look at large groups of mammal species. I want to draw your attention here to the green dots uh, uh, up at the top, which are the primates. And work that shows that primates tend to have a lower muscle mass than uh, non-primate mammals. And what you probably have here is a payoff in the energetic cost of movement and locomotion in primates that helps balance the expense of the relatively large brain we see in, across the, the primates. Uh, th there's also a very interesting paper that came out in Nature last de December by Navaretta, Von Scheich, and Eisler on ener energetics and the evolution of human brain size. They, over the years, had collected a fantastic de de data set where they were able for hundreds of mammalian individuals to get fat-free mass. And what they found by doing the regressions with fat-free mass instead of total uh, body mass that we'd used is that there was really no payoff of gut size and brain size across all, all of the mammals or even within the primates. But what they did find that was very surprising is that there was a strong negative relationship between brain size and adipose tissue. So you out there had large brains and were very skinny, or you were very fat in terms of adipose tissue and had relatively small brain size across all of the mammals. And what their explanation for this was is these are your two safety nets if you're a mammal. Uh, you can use your brain to give yourself a generalist type of ad adaptation, or you can carry around your reserves for a hard time as fat. And what, what their ar argument was, was that humans had actually bucked this relationship, that we have both the generalized large brain size, but we also have the adipose tissue. So we basically have two insurance policies here. Uh, and and that, that they've also uh, de developed a model in terms of diet and all of the other trade-offs that you can have when you're uh, trying to balance your energy budget. You can have high quality food, you can have cooperation and um, sort of your, 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 your safety net with groups of people. Uh, you can cut down your locomotion costs, cut down production and growth and re reproduction. So uh, as we're go go going through uh, the talks uh, today, what I what, what want you, you to think about is all of the different possibilities that we can have in terms of balancing our uh, uh, energy relationships. And uh, that whenever we're talking about diet, as we go through the uh, uh, evolutionary period, think about how your energy budget, budget relates to your growth and development, relates to your social re relationships, the amount of fat you're carrying around, whether you're storing food, because it all comes to, to together in a big package like this. So we're, we're going to have a, a very fun time uh, t today going through the entire fossil record. And I'd like to thank Carter for giving us a chance to do this.